Good morning. Know this song, uh, and uh, many of you may not. I'm going to sing the chorus first, and uh, I'm going to sing it from there because I'm going to one more part. Your mighty hand can save me, and a good firm in raging seas. No power in hell can stand against your mighty hand. Your heart remains unchanged. Your love calls me to my knees. Not even death can separate your mighty hands. As we go through the song, the parts that you know, just sing out. And if uh, you don't know, just make it your prayer to the Lord.
God, you are great and glorious and greatly to be praised. And we just lift your name up this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Just checking. Jim, do you have any announcements for us? Um, let's see. Um, just want to thank everybody that came out to Relay and helped with Relay uh, the other night. We had a great, great night and cleared almost a $1,000. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know of a lot of things up upcoming. Um, next week will be a first Sunday. And, of course, we'll have the children's uh, musical will be next week that they're going to start. Uh, at the 11 o'clock service, they'll be doing a call to worship here, the combined choirs from Grace and our church. And then they will exit the sanctuary and get on the vans and go over to Grace and perform for their morning worship service. And then they'll be back here. Um, I think the newsletter or the email that went out yesterday said parents can pick up their children at 1220 over at Grace and then uh, come back that night at 6 o'clock. We're, we're to provide sides and salads, casseroles, that kind of thing. They're going to Grace is going to provide chicken and dessert. So we'll have a meal, and then at 6.45, we'll, uh, music will be performed in here. So it's going to be a really neat day. We're calling it the uh, Brunswick Tour uh, for the Children's Choir. And if we can add a venue over at Magnolia Manor, we may call it the Glen County Tour. So anyway, plan to be here next week. Um, day of Prayer, you want to say anything about that next week? And it May the 4th? Thursday. At 7 o'clock right here at First United Methodist Church. There, yeah. Surprised, Jim. We can't hear you. Sorry. There we go. National Day of Prayer is Thursday night. Now, there's an early morning service, I think, at Blythe Island. St. Simons. St. Simons. Okay. Community Church, yeah. early in the morning. And then a noon down at, the, down at the pole at the City Hall. And then 7 o'clock here at night and we're, we're the host for that and several people including shannon and tim and annie will be lending the help with praise music and we'll have the different prayers that'll be divided up so encourage you to come out seven o'clock on uh, thursday may 2nd for national day of prayer awesome would y'all stand back up and we're gonna sing ten thousand reasons bless the lord of my soul Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, O oh my soul Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Rich in love. near 
and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Well, God, open our hearts and eyes and souls to receive from you this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon, Nancy, Susan. Thanks for being willing to fill in this morning for Tim and Annie. And I'm sorry for my fumble fingeredness on a MacBook Pro. I'm not skilled in MacBooks. No, I'm not skilled in any of them, really. But anyway. They say uh, anybody can run a MacBook. And I, I, I've heard that. They say I, it's I, I have heard that, yes. I, I have heard that, and it's not very flattering. Um, okay, now tell me the truth. How many of you are here this morning because you saw the picture of the kilt in the newspaper? Did, did, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is we get that thing... <laughs> get that thing out we had so much fun and then it gets posted on Facebook and my family starts making smart comments about my legs you know no sun skinny legs whatever you know what I'm saying give me a break come on um, anyway it's good that uh, glad that you're here this morning and keep Tim and Annie as they travel in your prayers and uh, really next week should be a good day for us we're, we're really looking forward to the this combination thing Doug, Doug Force is so excited he's the pastor at Grace and I am too, that we're being able to do something together like this with our children's choirs. And um, we'll, we'll have a lot of fun. And I think that you'll enjoy it. And the musical's gonna be, gonna be really, really neat. Okay, now today, uh, the passage of scripture for our text, and remember that we're talking about the changes that happen because of the risen Christ. And the title for today is Privileges of Belonging. You know, we all know those places that you can belong to. I, I remember visiting my son-in-law, I mean, my brother-in-law, uh, back before his days of being a vineyard pastor in Newark, uh, Ohio, it was uh, a tiler, laid tile. And there's a place on the east, on the west side of, of Columbus called Gehenna. Now, it was always interested me that they named it the place Gehenna because that is the Hebrew name for hell uh, in the Old Testament. And um, the lots in this place, it was owned by... Uh, 
and I used to know his name as well as I know my own. He, he, he owned The Gap and Victoria's Secret and so on. Um, and his name's not coming to me right now, but it will in a second. But the building lots in here, you, you paid a million and a half for the building lots, and then you had a covenant to build. You had to build a house on the lot from a million and a half up to five million. Uh, had an upper limit, which surprised me, but there were 440 lots in this development. And uh, to belong to the country club was 100000 a month. Hey, y'all. Oh yeah, that was, uh, that was just to belong. Now, you know, if you're going to pay that kind of money, and I, I'm thinking back, this was, this was quite a few years ago, I'm thinking, where, where does this kind of money come from? What in the world? But if you're going to pay that kind of money, you know, there are privileges to belong to something like that. And what are the privileges when we read in our text this morning, which comes to us from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and this is what it says there. And this is the Apostle John writing these words. He says, Behold, what manner of love. Now, I want to say that right with the right inflection in my voice because uh, we, we don't get the emphasis enough in English. We said, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And I'll tell you, that is something that's coming in the future that's a part of the, of the hope of what we are, when we become children of God, and we're probably not going to get all the way to that this morning, but nevertheless in verse 3, and we'll come back and pick that up at the future at some point. In verse 3, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Shannon, you didn't have, the, did the monitor not work for you? Oh, is it plugged in now? It was? And if you press the on button, <laughs> gotcha. There it comes. Yeah. But we're not on the top screen. There we go. Okay. All right. See, we're scrambling this morning, y'all. Th this tells you what what a true ministry Rachel and Scotty feel, and and of course Jim and. Everybody that comes and helps out with tech stuff. So we're grateful. I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Now, what, what incredible love it is that God has given us, has shown us because of Christ that we become, uh, that we're called the children of God. What does it mean uh, to belong to the family of God? What does it mean to be a child of God? What are the privileges of belonging uh, to, to God? I want to share this little story with you about Mm, 14 years, uh, 12, 14 years, um, and I could figure out the exact day, it was six, 13 years, after we left Boca Grande, my father was the minister on Boca Grande Island in Florida. Now, that's on the west coast, straight out from Fort Myers, a beautiful resort island. It's incredible. I was a little boy in fifth and sixth grade living in paradise, and I didn't know it. Uh, the island is just beautiful where we used to paddle around in homemade canoes. I was looking at Jim Weldy's kayak this morning out there in his, in his truck, and we used to take 16-foot pieces of tin and fold them over and put old rusty tin, put tar in the nail holes, you know, to make a canoe, crimp them in the end, spread them out in the middle, and have a canoe. Well, everywhere we used to run canoes up and down the bayous where the banyan trees were, uh, in Boca Grande, there are now million-dollar boat slips. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. I visited there. But I took my youth group from Perry down. Now, some of these kids, I'd been in fifth and sixth grades with. There weren't many kids on the island. They all go to Lemon Bay High School now. We had a little school on the island. And uh, so I knew some of these kids. Of course, it had been a long time since I'd seen them. But I had about 50 young people down there. We were camping in the fellowship hall of the Methodist Church and, uh, and had about 10 adults. And we were swimming at the beach one day, and I thought, you know, I'd like to take them to the pool, so I'm talking to the, some of the locals. Now, locals can get you in trouble. I mean, the local natives can really get you into trouble. And I, they were friends, you know, I've known them for a long time. One boy sidles up to me that I'd known, and we were hunting and fish together and stuff, and he said, he said, listen, I'll take you down, and I'm not going to name the place, but it's a real well-known <laughs> resort. He said, we'll go down there and go to the pool. And I said, really, can you get us in there? Because it's a very, very, pre in fact, John F. Kennedy and... Uh, um, Jackie O, not Jackie O then, <laughs> she was Jackie Kennedy, but uh, the president was on the island twice. While, while just the two brief years that we were there, they actually visited the island. 
I said, can you get us in there? He said, yeah, sure. He said, we'll, we'll meet down there just on this side, uh, outside the wall of the pool at 7 o'clock. So I've got my whole crowd, and we've got the bus parked outside the wall, and we've got all the kids down there and the adults, and we all troop off the bus, and we're lined up. And he said, we got a few more minutes to wait yet, and then we can get in. And I'm thinking, hmm, the place was closed. It was off season, see. We had to wait for the tide to get down <laughs> beneath the, the fence that went <laughs> into the car and we said come on follow me and I'm thinking he's got connections you know that this is okay to do so we go trooping in there about 70 people going to this huge pool I mean Olympic sized pool beautiful water the pool's all clean not a soul around nobody in the place and we're all trooping, you know, the water's about ankle deep at low tide, and we're going to the fence to go to the pool, and we start swimming. Well, after a while, fortunately, I knew him, uh, the local cop, and there was only one, and he showed up. He said, what? And he used some expletives, you know, what are y'all doing in here? I said, well, so-and-so, I turned around to look, and I see his tail end going around the fence, <laughs> heading, heading home, you know. He's going to the house. The rest of us are in the pool. And one of my 10th graders who had, and I'll never forget it, one of my 10th graders who had lost his glasses in the waves the day before, and he's bouncing up, big old boy, and he's bouncing up, Jim, Jim, I can't see, I've lost my glasses. So he doesn't have his glasses on, and I'm pulling everybody out of the pool. I said, come on, y'all, this was a mistake. I said, I'm so, I'm so sorry, and please stand there with a scowl on his face, you know. And, and I said, we're going to have to go back out around the fence. By that time, the tide had started to come back in again, so it was a little bit deeper, but... Um, this boy swims up to me, and y'all, he's a very successful man now with two uh, teenage daughters, so he has taught his daughters how to live and what not to do. This was a kid who was always getting into trouble, and he swam up to me. I said, come on, get out, get out of the pool. He swam, where is everybody, where is everybody? He walks up, and he sees this blue uniform in, in his blindness, you know, standing up beside him. He's, is it the heat? <laughs> I snatched him by his hair, and we got out of there and went out. Well, anyway, the people who own the hotel, you see, there's privileges of belonging, and you have the rights to do something. I had a caddy in my church in Waynesboro who was a caddy at the National at Augusta. And, uh, man, he could just go in and out because he was a, had been working up there for 20, 25 years. Of course, they changed the rules and take your own caddy on the National now. But what does it mean to say... That God is our Father, we're children of God. What, what does that really mean? How does that, how does that translate? And I, I want to say to you that there, when we talk about the changes that, that the risen Lord makes in our lives, sometimes I wonder how close the encounter was that people claim is their salvation experience. How close was that encounter with the risen Christ? You know, uh, there was a song that came out, what's it, Middle 80s, The Zombies, What's Your Name, Who's Your Daddy, Is He Rich Like Me? Do you remember the words of that? And then all that whole phrase was taken and twisted and perverted and all that kind of thing. It's become a slang term and so on. But uh, that phrase all it just kind of rang through my mind ever since the zombie sang it, you know. What's your name? Who's your daddy? And we could ask each other that. What's your name? Who's your daddy? Spiritually, who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? Uh, what is your relationship to this risen Lord? Now, C.S. Lewis, who is a tremendous philosopher, thinker, teacher at Oxford University in, in England, a uh, powerful man of God, even though late in life he came to the Lord, but his thinking was such that God, when he got a hold of him, made him a child of God, and he could, uh, he could delve into truths that, that some of us have to be led into. It's just not apparent on the surface. You know, there's some diamonds that you can pick up right on the surface, like the gold on, on Juneau Beach in Nome, Alaska. You could go along and pick it up and sift the sand. Well, all of that's long gone because they did that a long time ago. So it's not readily available. You have to be led to the deep stuff, and that's what C.S. Lewis does. And then screw tape letters. Uh, screw tape is a demon who... Uh, who his nephew Wormwood has been given a task of keeping a Christian from achieving his potential. And in this particular challenge, screw tape letters is what they're called. They write back and forth to each other. And screw tape says to his nephew Wormwood, he says, the enemy, and that's what he calls God, the enemy has this dream that he can turn them all into his children. Think about that for a second. He has this dream that he can turn them all into his children. And he said, you must keep that from happening. 
Well, the first point that I want to make to you this morning in looking at this particular passage is when, we, when God says to us through John, and remember this is the beloved disciple, this is the one who writes most often on love. He's the one who engages us in relationship with the living Christ. He's the one who laid his head on Jesus' chest and said, who's going to betray you tonight at the Last Supper? And John says, behold, the manner of love that this is. Now, what manner of love is that? Well, and I want to say to you, first of all, to belong to the family of God, to gain the privileges that, are, that go to belonging to the family of God, you have to be a card-carrying lover. Have to be a card-carrying lover. There it is, a card-carrying lover. Okay, thanks, Anna. Um, you have to be a card-carrying lover. Can we reclaim a word that's been stolen from us in Christianity? Can we reclaim a word that means something so much more than what our culture uses it for today? You know, to love what God loves, to be the kind of lover that God wants us to be, I want to say this to you, and I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit of teaching because, because I like this. I've done some st stuff on this with marriage and family things. But love has an origin and it has an object. Love has an origin and an object. Now, when I say anything that we say in the Christian experience can be perverted, it can be changed, it can be substituted, it can be faked, and that's what the enemy of our soul wants to do. He wants to take what is so good, so beautiful, can be so powerful in our lives, and he wants to subvert it to keep it from reaching its goal. Now, true love has an origin. Now, the Word of God tells us where the origin of true love is in this world, and it's with God himself. God is love. God is the very nature, the very substance of his nature and the characteristics that that surround God, that define God, is love itself, true love itself. He is the origin. But then love has an object. And true Christian love, true Christian love has two things in it. And I want you to understand this. Because, you see, to belong to the family of God, to, to experience this manner of love that he says that we're called the children of God, first of all, true love has righteousness attached with it, in other words, good things attached with it, and then it has desire. Now listen, righteousness meaning that which is right, that which is good, that which is pure, and then it has desire, and they work in harmony. They work together to produce the kind of love toward the object that God has given us, whether that's a person, a vocation, the will of God, whatever God may place in our lives, there is an object of our loves. Now listen, what is righteousness when you have love? What is righteousness without desire? It's a rigid, frigid, legalistic approach to relationship. And, and there's not much emotion attached to it. What is desire without righteousness? defining the love that should be in our lives? Well, it's very simply lust. It's lust. It's anything goes. And that type of experience leads us ultimately to selfish expressions of love. And I can tell you that for every perverted form of love that there is in the world, it finds its root in selfishness because it ultimately is an expression of getting what I want. It doesn't have an object, and it certainly is not righteous, and therefore it's, it's, it, it is a selfish understanding, and everything that we get, and sometimes even giving, becomes a selfish aspect because we hope to get in return. Now, let me say this to you, because this is the true characteristic of Christian love. Desire is the beauty of righteousness. I, I, hope you can, I hope you can wrap your mind around that. 
Because, you see, God wants you to have desire in your life. God wants you to have that emotional desire, and he wants you to use that emotional desire to his end. And desire is the beauty of righteousness. It is the driving force whenever love is good, whenever love is pure. Righteousness, righteousness is the strength of desire. Righteousness is the strength. Desire is the beauty of righteousness. When a love is good, when a love is pure, and that's what God's love is for us, then desire is the beauty. And, and you find that, that emotional attachment to the loves that God wants you to have in your life. Righteousness is the strength of desire. And then, you see, it becomes God's loves become your loves. And, and God leads you into the loves that he wants in your life. And they can be absolutely and completely, and I'm talking about the spectrum of human experience, they can become completely and absolutely satisfying. And I mean, that runs the gamut of human experience. Hold nothing back. Whether it deals with personal relationships, intimate relationships, vocational relationships, whatever. You see, this is, this is the manner of love that God has for us to experience in his life. We are a lover of God and the things that he loves and the people that he loves. You see, to belong and to have the privileges of belonging to the, as a child of God, you have to be a card-carrying lover. Now, secondly, if you have it, and if you're a card-carrying lover in the kingdom of God, then you become a child of God. You become a child of God. Listen to this. I, I like these, these things because we ask ourselves, how do we become? How do we become? Uh, Dad, what is a Christian? To this question, the father replied, a Christian is a person who loves and obeys God. He loves his friends and neighbors and even his enemies. He prays often, is kind, gentle, holy, and more interested in going to heaven than in earthly riches. That son is a Christian. The boy looked reflective for a moment and then asked, have I ever seen one? <laughs> have I ever seen one? Now, there is a... I have hanging on my wall a couple of, couple of degrees, but I like the way this one reads. And this, this is what it says. To all persons to whom these presents shall come, greeting, be it known that my name, having satisfied all the requirements for the degree of Master Divinity, listen to these words, is accordingly admitted to that degree with all the honors, rights, and privileges thereunto appertaining here and elsewhere. Do you know what? That's what happens when we become a child of God, when we confess him. We are accorded honors and privileges. And the transformation that happens because of our belief, because of our confession. And you see, what, what Paul, uh, I mean, what John leads into this passage in, in the preceding uh, chapter, in chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, listen to it. He says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone, listen, Everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. You see, what, what we have to ask ourselves is, have we had that transformation? Have we had that encounter that has produced the beauty in us that God wants for us? Listen to this, this quote from uh, God by Moonlight, Amy Carmichael. She describes an atlas moth emerging from its cocoon. Uh, in the mountain forest west of Donover, India, and she writes, it hangs from a twig like a small brown bag, and however often we see it, we are never prepared for the miracle that emerges. It has wings of crimson and pink and blended green, blended green of various soft tones, shading off into terracotta brown, old gold. Each wing has a window made of a clear substance like a delicate flake of talc. And on the edge of each is a pattern of wavy lines or dots or some other dainty device. From wingtip to wingtip, nine 
sometimes 10 inches of beauty, one of God's lovely wonders. That is what comes out of the brown paper bag. Who would think that such exquisite beauty could come from a drab and dull cocoon? But much greater, a much greater miracle awaits the child of God. Encased by these bodies of humiliation, we look for that day when the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. When you're a card-carrying lover and a child of God, oh, there are promises, there are benefits. God's loves become our loves. I, I get the feeling that so many people are living so far beneath privilege. And you, you've heard people say that before. You've heard preachers use that phrase. There was a movie that came out a few years ago with the title, Children of a Lesser God. Did anybody see that? I, I like the movie, a little bit too much gratuitous sex in it, as there always is. But uh, I, like that, I like that movie because a deaf person learns to communicate. But that phrase comes from uh, Idols of a King by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And Tennyson wrote that phrase in connection with the idea that a king musing on the beauty and the benefits of the universe says, I see God out there in the universe, in the stars and the worlds and things that are formed. But when I go to war and I have to draw my sword and I have to take a life, he said, it seems as though we're made, we're the children of a lesser God. Well, you see, it doesn't, it doesn't take away from the fact that we're, because we live in a world of difficulty, because there are troubles that surround us, because there are problems that we face in life, doesn't mean that we need to live at that level. We are children of God. We are His. The transformation that comes about changes us completely. And, and then the third point is very simply this as we close this morning. This then becomes the purifying aspect of your life. Listen to what he says in verse 3. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Listen, if there's anything that we need in this dirty world, it's purification. There are some people who need to be cleansed in their conscience. There are some people who need to be cleansed from guilt. There are some people who need to be free from fear. We need purity. Everything around us can become so nasty. And we need to know purity. Listen to this. Someone wrote in her memoirs, a group of teenagers were enjoying a party and someone suggested <clears throat> that they go to a hangout for a good time. I'd rather you took me home, young lady said to her date. My two parents don't approve of that place or that kind of activity. Oh, afraid your father will hurt you? One of the girls asked sarcastically. No, the girl replied, I'm not afraid my father will hurt me, but I'm afraid that I might hurt him. And she writes, she understood the principle that a true child of God who's experienced the love of God has no desire to sin against that love. Now, a little reading assignment to follow on this is to read the rest of that chapter because while I don't like to dwell on it, this is where the problem comes in. And, and the paragraph is entitled in my, in my Bible, Sin and the Child of God. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that Christ was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Become a card-carrying lover. Because you will love the things that God loves. You will love the way that God wants you to love. Shane was here last week, and there's this myth. And I, I'm not going to go into any, anything other than to say it's called for those men who have HIV or full-blown AIDS in some parts of the world, the myth of virgin cleansing. How much more impure can love be? How much more perverted can love be than to think that a grown man can be cleansed of his HIV by having a virgin? How, how frightful, how disgusting. Become a card-carrying lover and you are, a right, you are awarded the rights appertaining to being a member of the family of God. Shannon, come close for us, if you would.
song that I'm pretty sure you all don't know. Um, but it is possible. But um, I'm going to teach it to you. And uh, it really ties into this well. And um, the chorus goes like this. Oh, I am not the same. I'm a new creation. I am not the same anymore. I am not ashamed. I will not be shaken. I am not the same anymore. Would you all stand up and sing that with me? I am not ashamed. I'm a new creation. I am not the same anymore. I am not ashamed. I will not be shaken. I am not the same anymore. Hey, Josh, can you um sit down and do the slides on the song real quick? You just have to press the space bar. Here's those, we're going to start the rest of the song. First line is, you restore the wasted years. There we go. You restore the wasted years. You build the broken walls. Your love replaces fear. Mercy makes us whole. Adopted, healed, and lifted. Oh, I am not the same. I'm a new creation. I am not the same anymore. Oh, I am not the same. I will not be shaken. I am not the same anymore. Anymore. I bow before the cross. <clears throat> I bow before your cross. A broken life made you. Amazed at all you are, Lord, and who I am in you. Adopted, healed, and lifted, given, forgiven, found, and rescued. Oh, I am not the same. I'm a new creation. I am not the same anymore. I am not ashamed. I will not be shaken. I am not the same anymore. I will not 
be shaken. I am not the same anymore. Anymore. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to go from here, your children, uh, loving what you love uh, in the right way. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.